you can just tell us who is Lulu? Um, well, uh, how should I start? Um, firstly, thank you for having me here. I was very nervous about this, but I'm really honored that you guys could have me. Um, so Lulu is a young woman, uh, a media entrepreneur, um, passionate about media, passionate about Africa, passionate about the youth. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and um, I think my background, interesting that you, you guys looked out that I started when I was six years old. I actually started my first um, ever stage experience was when I was four years old. So my parents realized I had a passion for singing. And when I listen to the tapes now, I don't think I had the best voice in the world, but <laughs> my parents just saw that I, I, I was so passionate about it. I loved it, and my dad loved music. Um, his older brother was Smokey Hangala, so he taught him how to play the guitar, and I think he was excited about his little daughter liking to sing, so he wrote some songs, and we started singing from the age of four. At the age of six, we recorded a cassette um, and started doing some TV appearances, um, which got us on, you know, quite a lot of different platforms. Um, the president at the time saw me on TV and invited me to sing at State House. So that was my first experience with, you know, power and, you know, a big, you know, uh, personality. Um, and, you know, I've grown from there. Um, I went to school here in Zambia for my first grade. I moved to Zimbabwe because uh, my parents went for university. Uh, there when they had three kids yeah they sold everything and you know went to Zimbabwe and uh, we took the singing career a bit more seriously then because in order to raise funds to eat especially in their first year dad and I would have to go to different towns around Zimbabwe cross into Botswana sometimes sometimes cross back into Zambia sing at a church and hope that people are going to buy the cassette and with that money we used to eat so um, I think I started working at a really young age. My dad always teases me that I know you didn't have a, a real childhood and I wish I could like rewind, you know, the years so that you could have a normal childhood. But I, I worked from a really young age. You think you didn't have a real childhood? Um, it, it was there. I, I, if I had to rewind, I don't think I'll do it differently. It's, it's made me the woman I am today. Um, my parents instilled something that I think not many young people get at such a young age. Uh, you know, move on to when I was 11, 12, they had graduated, they were making a bit of money, but they still didn't have money to give me, you know, as pocket money. And they said, well, you seem to have good relations with certain people, why don't you ask them if they might have a job for you? The job that the people I asked had for me was to be a maid. So literally every day after school, I would go clean their house. For about a year, I did that. I was their maid. I would iron. They taught me, they taught me how to iron because I was such a lazy kid before. <laughs> but, you know, that was good for me in, in the long run because later in uni when I was stuck for, you know, jobs, I became a maid for the president of the university's wife. No, I went to university in, in South Africa. So... All those things sort of shaped me to be the woman I am today. Yeah. Awesome. So, other than after you graduated, did you ever work for anyone? Yeah, I, I was an employee for movie TV. Okay. Um, so right after university, I went straight into working with movie TV. Um, we were just starting out as a station. It was an exciting time to be there. Um, also because unlike I think a lot of the established TV stations right now, you had an opportunity to create. You were sort of given this platform to say, you know, there's all these hours, 24 hours, and we need content. So do what you can to create something. So we made a lot of mistakes, but we made TV. <laughs> so I worked there for three years. Um, but, you know, I always had this dream of owning a media company, production company. It was always in the back of my mind. And when I started work, I told myself, you're going to work a few years in TV, and then you have to work in the corporate world. Why? Because I think in the first year of working with movie TV, I realized at the time, our industry 
was not really being funded by the corporate world and I, I needed to understand why. People were going to the corporate world asking for money but they were not getting the money to fund their programs and I felt if I worked in the corporate world then I would learn more about you know how they talk, what they really expect from us as creatives and hopefully when I venture out on my own it would be easy for me to get money or get the deals because I've made the contact. So three years after being on TV I took the jump. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> I still ask myself how I did that. I just you know put in my resignation and went to church. Um, I believe in using your networks and I used my church network and I went to every single person that I felt was of influence. A lot I'd never spoken to before. And I asked them, you know, listen, I've got these qualifications, I've got a degree in comms, and if you hear of a job, please, I would like a job. I didn't think it would work, but I got a call back and uh, got to interview with Citibank. And so I worked with Citibank too. And after about three years with Citibank, that's when I really now ventured out as, you know, a young entrepreneur trying to have our own startup. So you get to understand why the, the corporate don't pay having joined Citibank? Yeah, I, I think it, 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 it shaped a lot of, of, of the decisions that I'm, I, I make even now. Um, I got to understand that normally when, when, when creatives go to the corporates, they go asking for money, but never giving the value that the company is going to get from sponsoring their content. Um, and it even happens with NGOs. Um, I say there's always, you can always sell it. You know, I do, we keep moving right now. And one of my strategies is try to get into the corporate social responsibility budgets for, you know, these corporates. Because most of them don't know what to do with it. But they're always trying to also see how, as much as they're giving back, they can still market to a certain target. So, you know. I tell NGOs, you know, look at, look at the people that you're targeting with your NGO. Normally you have a group of people that maybe Stanby can't reach right now. So as you go to Stanby to ask for money, tell Stanby, listen, you've got Anakazi banking right now. I work with women in this community. And these women in this community actually are able to use your Anakazi banking. So I'd like you to come on board, pay for this, and then you get an opportunity to market to them you know so um, those are things that I learned from the corporate world also just their language it's, it's very different you know how they perceive you in, in the way you are dressed. you know it's little things but I feel there's just a, a lot of lessons also on who has the money and who doesn't yeah so then after Citibank after Citibank I um, started Lulu Hangala Entertainment I <laughs> In my mind, I had done the biggest shows on TV at that time, the big game shows, because while I was working at Citibank in my last year, Movie TV asked me to consult with them on a very huge show that made millions for you know the company. And I thought, naturally, in any other place like South Africa, the US, when you've grown to this point, and you jump off to try it on your own, everyone will be running after you to get endorsements, to, you know, uh, sponsor your TV show. Unfortunately, that didn't really happen. Um, the few TV shows I got, I misused finances. I had no clue um, how to deal with contracts. So I made a lot of um, bad decisions. Um, and I ended up really down and out. I had to take my daughter out of school because, yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure at the time if I'd made the right decision. I knew I was passionate. I knew I had something to give. But clearly being a sole entrepreneur, truthfully, was not my thing. So did you consider going back into getting employed? Or I actually did. I, I, I went and got a job with... Uh, it's a startup advertising agency. Um, it didn't pay too well. I also um, went into radio. It was also a terrible pay, but I had to feed my daughter. Um, but in that time, I used to sort of grow the movement, which is we keep moving. Um, and it grew slowly. And also in that time, I, I also used to sort of 
uh, refine my brand. Uh, I had to change up some things, you know, how I dressed, how I looked. I was trying to appeal to an older audience and everybody I'd gone to initially was saying, she's a kid, so she only appeals to the kiddie shows. And so that's another reason things are not working so well for my business because of my personal brand at the time and what it represented. So I had to rebrand. Um, I had to uh, start investing in, in makeup artists, in stylists, in, in great photo shoots, in doing some free work so that people would notice that I'm, you know, she's actually a very good MC, you know, and she'll be able to handle a, a, a big crowd and uh, a crowd of serious people because I was known as the crazy girl that was really loud. I was paid to be loud. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think in that, that time I used to reshape myself to grow. Um, I used it to do a lot of free work. Um, that's how I got involved with the American Embassy and then got the opportunity to go to the Mandela Washington Fellowship. So where are you now? What are you doing? Well, now I am partner at at Dagon Media. Um, interesting story about how that happened and I think it's a testament of how if you're good at something, if you're pas truly passionate about it, sometimes opportunity will come to you. Mm -hmm. So I got back from the fellowship. It, honestly, it was a, a bit of a... It was very hard for me coming back from the fellowship because there was a lot of expectation. You know, you guys have gone for this fellowship uh, you've met Obama, you're one of the only two out of the 500 that have met Obama. Of course, now you're going to start a big business. The Americans have given you a lot of money, but that wasn't the case. I had to come and start again from ground zero. Um, so I started with just emceeing a lot of gigs. And um, one of the gigs I got the opportunity to emcee was the pre-launch party for Pizza Hut. And uh, I got to meet the owners of Pizza Hut at the time. And I threw a few ideas at them. You know, I remember telling my mom to say, I'm going for a meeting with the owners. It's just a dinner. They just want to meet the MC, but I'm going to go with the pitch. You know, so I prepared my pitch and I sat at that table where a number of us, I heard everyone talk. I listened out to what the, you know, the owners of Pizza Hut were planning into those plans. And so when I finally pitched, I was the right person for what they wanted and gave them a few ideas of how to sort of get into the local market and make the local feel like, okay, this is not such a foreign brand, but we can be a part of it. Um, that's when we started the seven days of giving, which is a great success. And we hit a world record with Pizza Hut as we opened. And that's how I got the opportunity to be brand ambassador. That relationship sort of grew. Um, maybe I took my brand ambassador role too seriously because but maybe also because I saw opportunity to grow with these people. And um, I would go into the shop. I wanted to learn how to make pizza. I wanted to know what they were doing with marketing. I was throwing ideas at them. And one day over literally wine and dinner, um, my senior business partner says, you know what? Every time we sit here together, we come up with better ideas than the marketing agency that we are paying. So why don't we try to start our own creative agency? And we talked about it, you know, we we're all very excited, there's four of us around the table. And um, in that week, the following week, he called me and he says, I'm really serious, Lulu. I really feel that you'd be a great part of the team and I'd like to offer you partnership into this new business. So what do you think? And I say, why me? He says, because you give us um, an insight that no one else seems to give us. And I thank, uh, I think I should credit my work at Movie TV for that because it helped me, you know, Movie TV was a community station. So you got into all types of communities and you got to learn a lot about the local market. Um, so, yeah, that's how the partnership began and um, Dagon Media started. So, uh, what, what are your, some of your proudest? I think seeing the business grow from one client, because we were initially just there for Pizza Hut, um, but see it grow to now take on you know bigger brands like Pepsi, 
And then our biggest um, at that time was Vodafone. I remember, you know, we were up against so many of the biggest advertising agencies in Africa to get that deal. And um, I was pregnant at the time and, you know, it was stressful on this side, but it was so exciting for us to get that big client, which has opened, uh, I think it just changed a lot about our little startup business very quickly. And from that moment, we've grown so fast into five different countries. So I think that's been the proudest moment, seeing us start from one client where, you know, for Pizza Hut, we would all sit around the table, about five of us, discussing a tweet that we feel should go up for Pizza Hut or, you know, we need to create a tone of voice and, and we would sit for hours talking about the tone of voice for this one client and being able to see us grow into getting so, you know, so many clients now doing so much more has been incredible. And from your experience, um, from where you've come from, from the time you were young up to where you are today, what are some of the things that you think um, grant people success in business? Some attributes that you've seen? I think being fearless. Yeah, be, being fearless and, and going for what you want against all odds. Um, there are so many times before, you know, things were great. Even now, you know, with Pizza Hut and, I mean, with Dagon Media especially, there were many times with Dagon Media that we almost quit. It wasn't making money. We were not getting any clients. But we just kept going. We had this belief in what, in what we, in the product that we had. We decided it doesn't matter. We're just going to go and go hard. Um, a lot of people would have shied away from a big account like, you know, Vodafone at the time. But we decided we're going to go for it. We were up against the biggest agency in the end fighting for that account. We went for it. So I think just being fearless and, and going for what you believe in. You know, if your product is truly different, you know, I believe as an entrepreneur, you need to, you need to bring a solution. So you need to look, there, there's a lot of people right now who are starting saloons or car washes. I had this question, so um, on Monday night we were in Kitwe with We Keep Moving doing, doing an entrepreneurship series and one of the questions was, you know, I want to start a car wash but there are lots of car washes, you know, but I want to start a car wash. So I said, well, what challenge have you seen with car washes that your car wash will be a solution to? And I think the most successful businesses have been those that have seen a problem and are the solution to that problem. So if you want to start up a lodge or you want to start a catering business, look around to see what everybody else is not doing and bring that new factor and believe in that product. And, and knowing that this is something different. People might not get it now, but with time they will get it. And I know that it can go so far because you're offering something new to the business. Yeah, even with the creativity. I came to Zambia from South Africa, school in South Africa, where I was offered a job to stay there. But I saw an opportunity when I came for internship at ZNBC in 2004. So in my last year of uni, I came here um, and worked at ZNBC for a month. And I saw a gap that I could fill. And I, and I feel that that's what brings success. See that gap and be that solution and success will follow. And in your journey, could you share maybe what has been your biggest challenge? I think people underestimating mm -hmm. uh, uh, me and my, and my potential, so sort of trying to put you down and not giving you opportunities because they feel either, especially when starting out in media, it was, you're a woman, this is for men, and uh, only men are supposed to you know, get this gig. Um, and that's what also let down my initial you know, Lulu Hangala Entertainment, they really believed in the guys getting a lot of, of, of those jobs. And um, 
a lot of people would ask to give one sexual favors in return for a deal. So I, lo- I lost a lot of endorsements because of that. I lost a lot of opportunity to um, get my company to do something for another company because I refused to, you know, return those sexual favors. So it's just that underestimating feeling that you are supposed to sink that law to get that. Um, and it continues, you know. I think it's, it's been a personal challenge, you know, for me as I've <laughs> grown. When you have something to offer. You know. Yeah, it is. But I don't think one should use that to stop themselves. You see, I, I, I find a lot of women who say, oh, you know, because I'm a woman, because, uh, you know, of this, I'm, I'm failing, so I can't do much, and I've given up, you know. What can I do? I keep going at it. And that's what I did. I, I didn't care. Oh, it's for a guy? Well, maybe I can do it better than the guy. Oh, you don't think so? Let me, for example, Samsung. My first real endorsement with, you know, some form of cash. Um, I did a lot of free work to show them that I was capable to do it. Better than the people they had claimed could do it, you know, better than I could. I had to prove myself. And I'm okay with it. I know people underestimate me, so I'll prove myself. That's great. <laughs> now, being a woman, being a mother, and um, from your profile, I noticed that you're involved in so many things, brand ambassador, you're a partner, and so forth. How do you strike a balance in terms of spending time with your family and being a brand ambassador and trying to take your company to the next level? Um, balance. Yeah, I like that uh, question. <laughs> if you had asked me that question about two years ago, I was a single mom at the time, um, I'll tell you, ah, it's so easy. I, I don't think it's the easiest thing to do. Um, and I think sometimes when people talk about balance, they, they want everything to go well. Nothing should suffer. But I feel that balance especially um, for women that are, you know, trying to deal with being a, a wife, a mother, then you're trying to run a business and, and do some social impact work and doing all this and that comes with some form of sacrifice. Um, so in the past year, my, my partners had to do, uh, do with Lulu not being there as much as she normally was. Um, that's a sacrifice. Okay, but also my family had to deal with mommy sometimes saying, hey, uh, I'm going to Kitwe, I need to go, and I just got out of hospital on Saturday, and my husband is saying, you can't go to Kitwe, and I'm like, I have to go. (laughs) I was not feeling my best, but I hopped onto that flight, did the job, came back, and that was sacrifice, even on my own body sometimes. So... um, it, it does come with some form of, of sacrifice, but a great support system also has been able to help me to, to get here. Um, tonight, my, uh, the nanny has stayed over a few hours so that, because we don't have a live-in, because again, that's sacrifice, because it's a norm in Zambia, you've got kids, you have a live-in nanny. But I think my husband and I are so busy that we decided to sacrifice that time, you know, just alone and the nanny is taking care of things, cooking and taking care of the kids, to have more time with our children um, at night without any disturbance from anyone else. That's hard on us. That's, that's hard on me. <laughs> um, but we get the nanny to come in and get some overtime so she'll stay with the kids. Sometimes our parents take the kids um, so that support system is great and just my husband himself also understanding that he married this <laughs> this crazy <laughs> woman who's always thinking about the next thing and whose hobbies become some form of work i, I recently uh, acquired a new hobby which is planning um, it, it was it, it's my way of releasing stress i, I get so happy in that moment of planning 
a special event for somebody and seeing them light up when they walk in and it looks amazing the food is great the photography is just right they don't have to stress about it that's my form of distressing but my form of distressing is still work so um you know i appreciate my support system who understand my madness <laughs> that's good madness <laughs> so the planning is it something that you're doing just to distress you're not charging it's just or is it well it, it has started making money now <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah it's it's really interesting i never thought it would make money and the first client that i had i actually was just testing to see if you would be willing to pay so he just said you know um i saw what you did for your son i've seen what you've done for your daughter i know you guys planned your own wedding that's really cool i'm planning to do something special for my wife and i don't know and i was like well if you pay me 3000 kwacha <laughs> i could plan for you and he said yes and i thought wait is he crazy is he seriously going to pay me 3000 kwacha to really pick up the phone and call four people mm-hmm. and give them my ideas of how i want it to go but then i realized that it doesn't come as easy for everybody mm-hmm. not not everyone you know sees the vision of how decor should look or mm-hmm. how the picture should look you should see me i'm behind the camera man no i want this shot i want mm-hmm. this and i never thought it would make money but i think that's 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 how you know people start diverting into different businesses sometimes it comes as something that was just a hobby and it starts making money for you i've actually seen some of your work on facebook i think it's amazing i was Thank thinking you. is this lulu <laughs> <laughs> it takes a team you know i'll yeah. i'll be quick to say as a planner i think you just need to have the vision but you need the right team to be able to execute it for it to look that amazing hmm. yeah so we have a lot of uh young people getting into um they're starting up com- companies businesses and one thing i've always noticed about you not myself many people actually we were talking about it earlier okay. is your confidence <laughs> <laughs> you you you've always been confident um and when i saw your message earlier to say i'm nervous <laughs> does that ever happen when you're having an event or you be before people or as an mc Yeah, um one thing a lot of people don't know about me. Uh it took a lecturer to tell me that I belonged in front of the camera and not behind. When I went to uni, I believed I was going to be a producer. I never used to talk on stage. I used to sing. So I remember my young brother is is in is in the audience right now and our parents also made everybody had to become a singer. Shame. I think it was my fault, but everybody had to become a singer so sometimes because my dad was a pastor we would all be up front singing as a family when it came to speaking my mom would never give me the chance to speak because she knew i had serious stage fright so even as a kid i'd go to a huge concert i'd be shaking before when i get on stage i'd perform but when i get back down i'd shake and start crying i'd get some form of a panic attack so It's something I've struggled with but I've had to teach myself how to handle myself. Firstly it started in front of the camera then I started to have to do talks. I had to teach myself. Um so the confidence didn't really well some could say it came naturally but I feel there's a lot I've had to teach myself. Um I had to start speaking in front of the the mirror to gain confidence. <laughs> um my everyone that works with me I have one of my team members here Bupe has to deal with my near panic attacks before every event uh my husband had to deal with a panic attack before I got here but I've had to since I'm a goal getter also I I sometimes tell myself listen being nervous is not going to get you anywhere you need to go talk to that person so go talk to that person and forget how you feel um I even have issues walking alone in public <laughs> It's something people don't know um that I I I can be extremely shy and I I hate walking in public so yeah either my mom or pull my sister someone I need to go shopping in Shoprite I'm nervous uh, please come with me so 
But I think it's something that you can learn. Um, and for young people, I feel confidence will take you a long way. Um, and mastering the art of networking and, and how to speak in public. It's something you can learn. I think I am proof of that. You see, I, I asked everyone to network earlier, so I really don't know how that went. Um, I'll ask Lulu one more question. So if you can just get the mics ready, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Um, my last question before we, we open it up to the audience is, what are your thoughts about the Zambia startup scene currently? I feel more than ever we've got a crop of young people who really a business minded in Zambia. Maybe it's because of the economy, um, you know, maybe there are not so many jobs, but I just still feel like suddenly there's this crop of young people who believe that they can be their own boss and they can do so much. Um, we had a focus group uh, just last week for one of our new clients um, and at Dagon Media and some, we asked a question what would you do if you were given a hundred thousand kwacha? Uh, now, some, some of my business partners are not Zambian, and in their minds, whenever they've asked this question in the UK or anywhere else, they've always gotten, I'll buy a car, I'll go for a shopping spree. Guess what? We had 12 young people in two different groups. Each young person talked about something entrepreneurial. We had an economic student who said, I want to open a dance studio. You know, I believe there's no real good dance studio, but people love dance in Zambia. We had um, a lawyer talking about starting another type of business. Everyone was talking about some form of business. And I said, guys, we have to tap into this because the young Zambian is now starting to think about how can I create? How can I be innovative? Um, I do feel we can do more in terms of mentoring them, but platforms such as Startup Grind are opening up the conversation with people that have made it successfully, who can share what they've, you know, what they've done. We also have Bongo Hype who are doing well, and I must um, plug in Vodafone um, because I am um, working with them as a consultant on their youth program. Their corporate social responsibility program is amazing. So they created this website for young people, www.jump.co.za, and I was asked to be the editor for entrepreneurship. I feel it's a fantastic platform for a young entrepreneur to go and learn as much as they can, and soon we are going to be partnering with so many other different companies like Bongo Hive and you know, other companies that can give even more in-depth um, practical articles and videos and we're also creating an innovation center that's going to be coming up very soon you're going to hear about it at one of the malls a big innovation center where young people can come in throw around ideas and we can help them grow their businesses so what makes me happy right now is yes we've got a lot of young people that have all these great ideas but I'm excited about the fact that we now have platforms and different companies who are realizing this mm -hmm. and are tapping into it. And, and hopefully, very soon, we'll be that country that is you know, creating stuff, that is inventing stuff. I'm excited for where Zambia has to go. You can even see government is getting interested in this. We just had an uh, entrepreneurship summit last year. So you can see they do understand that the young person is thinking very differently. Um, I'm just hoping that you know, the young startups uh, take their ideas seriously. Uh, they do the paperwork. Uh, I think that's what's lacking sometimes, you know. Uh, and they grow. We have lots of, you know, great ideas. You know, people start companies. They make X amount of money and they settle there. And that frustrates me. For things even just as small as, you know, a saloon, I'm like, you, you're clearly doing really well as a Zambian homegrown saloon. Take it into the malls. You know, like Namaka has done. That excites me. Take it into the malls. Expand. Look at um, Umoyo. Started out with one store and she's expanded. We have the opportunity to do that. So let's start to think bigger. Let's, let's not keep our minds so small. Um, so yeah, it's an exciting time in Zambia, I think, for startups, but I'm hoping that we can start to scale up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Are the questions ready? Those were very nice remarks that you ended with. And I have to agree with you that uh, I think that's also the challenge that we face as well. They're very, so many passionate people. But I think it goes back to the paperwork. Seeing the businesses as being settling and being small, but not thinking broader, not thinking bigger. They're thinking Lusaka, but not thinking Zambia across international so pretty much those are kind of like the businesses that we also try to um, try to those are kind of people that we also want to think in some space um, but it's uh, I think something that's very passionate to me that it's a question on partnership and um, those are kind of like the challenges as well when it's um, especially when it comes to females working together um, agreements and we find that um, in the long run you find that they will break apart and they will separate. Um, I just want to find out exactly how that has worked for you. Uh, I, I'm not sure if your partner is female. I'm not. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just. I'm just creating an assumption right now. Okay. But on the issue of partnerships and being being a partner, how is it that you fit perfectly with? How do you complement each other? And how does the initial agreement start? I think that's pretty much an area which I would uh, obviously talk about the challenges, but how has it been for you when it comes to when it in the issues of partnerships? Um, okay, so I don't know if we can say that women partnerships don't work. I've, I've seen some work, and I'm, I'm really not for the notion that women really don't support each other. There are some male partnerships that have not worked, so point of correction there. <laughs> Yeah, a partnership here. Yeah. Okay, so my, my interesting, my, my partners are all male. Yeah, so all my, my business partners are, are male. Um, there's one of the Zambian business partners is um, from this holding company. Uh, I think it's someone you've had before, Cesar Siwale. Um, and um, then there's the rest, Max Remington Hobbs, Jono, um, Stefano, Benedicta. So it's, it's an all male, and I'm, and, and I'm the only female partner. Um, I think something that very few uh, young Zambians think about also is partnership. I know that even from our business point of view, there are some partnerships we've tried to create, but you find someone say, no, I want to be the boss. I, I want to own 100%. Um, and I think um, with our businesses, but with the good paperwork done right, that you're not being um, screwed over, forgive the, the French, um, I think you should be willing sometimes to take a small piece of the pie for the potential to grow so much bigger. So my piece of the pie was really tiny, but I was willing to get into this partnership because I knew that the people I was getting on board with came with different strengths that I didn't have. So we all came together with different strengths. So there's, there's something I brought to the table, but there's something they brought to the table. I'm clearly not good with finance, but I came with, you know, on board with people who've been investment bankers and, you know, and so forth. And they do all the, uh, the generating of funds and going out to fundraise for the business and, and bringing investors on board. So they are, are very good at that. And, and I am also good at something. So I think when you look at partnership, make sure it's somebody, you're not just the same two, two people that are you know equal in terms of what you know and what you can or cannot do i feel the best partnerships work when it's two you know different strengths people with different strengths coming together to create something really dynamic um and and, and amazing um but the paperwork is important it does get frustrating sometimes um there are times you might even feel used um especially in a in a, in a moment where things grow way bigger than you know you expected in in my case for example the vision initially was to grow into different countries and and i would be partnering in all those different countries but at the point when it started to grow so quickly the other partners had the finance to push into the other markets i didn't so i've stayed a partner for the zambia for dagon media zambia and i've been unable to grow with them as quickly as they did but they had that you know, finance to do that. So it, it gets frustrating. You're like, no, but I want to be part of it all. And, and, and I can't. But 
the paperwork clearly, you know, sort of states all that and, and always make sure you have signed that paper. I tried certain partnerships before and I didn't sign that paper and people made money and walked away. So, um, yeah, it's very important that you have a good legal team or, you know, we always have someone that we know who's got some legal background that can help you look through those papers so that you don't make any mistake or you are not um, taken advantage of. Because also I think um, when you look at partners that come from abroad, I have seen people, you know, get really messed up because they didn't look at the dotted lines. They didn't look closely at the T's and C's and, you know, ended up being used. So, yeah, I hope I've answered adequately. Lulu, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs come here. A lot of people come to give us beautiful ideas and all sorts of uh, what they've done, how they've managed to succeed in life. And the funny part is, trust me, when you meet these people out there, actually, you can't even talk to them. And they're like, when you came to the startup grind, it was so good to see you. And we thought actually we could actually come to your door and knock and find out what more we can get out of you. But when people go out of this door, trust me, things change. So what are you doing to, when it comes to mentoring people? Or how is your door? Is your door open to people? Like if I come say I want to meet you and share some ideas. Is your door maybe also going to close upon leaving this place? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe I'll talk a bit about We Keep Moving, if, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, that's fine. So I started what we call the We Keep Moving project because I did realize that there was a bit of a gap. So initially it started out as just inspirational, motivational, take any form of person to young people in high schools and churches. Uh, but recently we started this entrepreneurship series. And... Um, we are taking entrepreneurs, yes, like Startup Grind is doing, but we're taking them to these different places, meeting young people, getting them to hear the talks. But another thing we are doing is creating partnerships with people that we know when we are too busy can still help a startup grow. And that's why we've got part, you know, we are coming on board with partners like Bongo Hive um, and different partners who will be able to, when I, my door can't open at the time, I know that I through we keep moving i can refer someone to my partners that can be able to add value to you know a young person's life so my partners are different with entrepreneurship i've got different partners and very soon um there'll be announcement on the 31st of may of a new partnership that i've made so one of my strategies when it comes to my personal brand and being brand ambassador is that i have attached my all my endorsements to my social impact I'm making money with a salary. So any other money that is going to come in, I want to sort of attach to my giving back because I don't have enough to give back. So all my endorsements from the Samsung endorsement, it was partnered to We Keep Moving. So they had to put money into We Keep Moving in order for me to stand and influence for their brand. The same thing with Pizza Hut. I'm Pizza Hut brand ambassador. Pizza Hut does not directly give me all the money that is for my fee. Part of the agreement is that you need to support We Keep Moving so that we are touching young people's lives and touching as many people as I can because I also understood that I couldn't always do one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So how could I, because I'm a product of mentorship and, and a big part of my story, I hope this is not going to be too long in answering, but let me just give you a brief background of where I come from and why I'm so passionate about mentorship. I was born in a place that had no, you know, running water or electricity. My, my mom and dad had to ride eight kilometers to the main road. My mom was on the back of a, of a bicycle on a dust road to get to the main road to finally hitchhike to get to UTH to give birth to me. How did they get out of that situation? It was through people mentoring them. So my first experience with mentorship was through what I saw my parents go through. But it was one-on-one. -on -one. Later on, they hadn't done too well in their grade 12, and someone mentored them, advised them. They rewrote their grade 12 with three kids and went to school. So that was my first experience with mentorship. And you know what? I also got mentored. I, my, my high school was paid by a woman that I do not know. I was a maid, and the people I worked for found a sponsor for me to go to a private school. 
And that was all just mentorship. So mentorship has a ripple effect. So I came back now and I looked at what was going on in Zambia and I said, a lot of people are too busy to give that type of mentorship that maybe I had. So what platform can I create to give more young people at least a chance to hear stories? Because, you know, places like the US, the UK, even just South Africa, people have books. You can give a young person to read. This is the book on how Bill Gates got to where he was. Okay, um, this is a movie about how the guy who started Apple started it. So here, be motivated, be mentored through this film or through this book. But Zambia doesn't have that. And that's why the We Keep Moving project is passionate about giving opportunity and opening up more opportunities for young people to be mentored. Because I believe in the power of even just one session. Certain decisions I've made in my life have come from just hearing someone speak just once sharing their story and I've been able to make certain decisions in my life that have impacted me positively. So yes, people are busy, but I, I'm hoping that through the We Keep Moving project, I can be able to impact more lives than I would have if I just started on one-on-one. -on -one. Is my door open? Most of the time it is through my PA. <laughs> and, that, and, and that is because I, I've, I've had to also Naturally, I think I, I would be open every time, but I found that either my family was suffering because I was always out there for everybody. Um, so it is open for people that I know that I can actually help. So there's sort of a filtering process that goes through my PA and then, but when it's not, I'm hoping what we are doing, if we keep moving, can help to impact lives. Kim, okay, that was good. Yeah. But I think also just to make mention, we do have speakers who come to, you know, share their stories. And most of them are busy. But uh, we, we hope that, you know, once you hear their story from this platform, it will help you make decisions that will, you know, accelerate your business one way or the other. Another question. Maybe I should say celebrities. They are so much centered on driving nice cars and uh, doing all sorts of things. So how have you been able to manage your finances and doing all those events that you do, the parties? And I want to know how you manage your finances because I'm also starting up a business and I want to learn from you how you manage your finances. Okay. Uh, I think I'm surrounded by very real people <laughs> <laughs> who always shoot me down when I try to live beyond my means. I really believe in living within your means. Um, it's something that um, I try to practice and even, you know, getting into marriage, I think I, I met a partner who also believed in, in budgeting, in saving, and we are not about the biggest car or the best looking house. Our, our house is really just, you know, a normal house, small little house, and we are planning to build. And so we decided instead of moving into this grand four bedroom mansion, that maybe we could afford, why don't we save up to build? The reality is that, um, you know, Zambia is a very different market from, you know, the other markets. So you, you really have to live within your means. And as you are starting your business, remember that you have to sacrifice. You can't go out as much as you want to go out. I had to learn how to, not that I didn't know how to cook, but I had to learn how to cook a bit better because, well... <laughs> I, I I realized we couldn't afford to always go out. So we don't go out as much to eat because we eat the good food at home. You realize that 150 kwacha will buy you one steak in a restaurant. That 150 kwacha will buy you really nice four to five steaks in food lovers of cured meat. Like really, not, not cured meat. What's the word? for good meat, matured meat, eh? Uh -huh. <laughs> Married to someone in the industry, <laughs> hospitality. <laughs> so, um, it'll buy you four good steaks and we have a great steak at home and I'll cook a meal that should look like that meal that would have eaten out. So, you know, we try to save as much as we can and, and literally live within our means. I mean, if you live four people, I know people who drive really expensive cars and literally their pay goes to 
to putting in fuel and I'm sorry I I don't want to live that life they are sending the kids to the most expensive schools and they're in loans and they're you know I I I don't want that you know a good example we got married and had 40 people at our first wedding because we couldn't afford the big wedding at the time and so we spent some time you know saving so that we could pay for what we could afford so was there a second wedding because you said first yeah there, there was and i think that's that's what you saw on social media and and all that and and you know i i, I must mention that if there's something that i try to do you know even on my social media pages i realize um with influence you know we have power to influence people and i try to be as realistic be as realistic as i can about you know listen i know this looks like it was flashy but i got deals mm -hmm. so i'm being very honest with my my following because we have a responsibility to them and and i think sometimes a lot of known people forget the responsibility they have to their following um because you know i think you are not just creating a facebook page even your personal profile you have a responsibility to your friends and family that are following you to do something that will impact them positively okay so i feel that heavy burden of responsibility to my following to be real about certain decisions so that they are not fooled to believe oh she's okay with this i remember people being shocked about oh she got pregnant the first time and she was on a magazine cover and i said i have to be real i have a responsibility to my following to be real about this what happened i didn't get married you know the guy went you know i have to be extremely real so that people make try not to make the same uh, mistakes i made you know so yeah even with budgeting honey live within your means yeah if it means you're just going to eat shima and veggies and soup like i did one time my maid had to bring me a chicken and said but madam ngajeko nkuku mwanzi but at that time the truth is i couldn't afford i i couldn't afford anything else but i grew vegetables in my garden i had rep i had tomato i had milli meal i ate i didn't die yeah so let's let's just be real awesome we'll take the last question Hi. Hi Lulu. Hi. Um just uh, it's probably more advice than a question. Uh what advice would you give for a non-Zambian person who wants to break into the market currently? What would you say are the top maybe two trends within the women market? Hmm. Can I ask maybe what you plan to break into the market with? It's more lifestyle in terms of lifestyle and wellness so that's a combination do you think that is a market that's with you know you've traveled do you think zambia lusaka specifically and poppy kitwe are ready for that i would say if you've done your research um i'll go back to what i said earlier yeah. is there something missing yeah if there's something missing mm -hmm. it will sell it might take time okay but it will sell um though if it's something that's a bit flashy mm -hmm. like a nice really cool wellness center where i can get champagne and stuff when i go uh -huh. it will sell really quickly cuz zambians like things they like things <laughs> so i can bring the things huh? yeah okay <laughs> they like good things they they <laughs> like to be seen at the good place but we've seen some really good places also sort of rethink their strategy because they said you know we want exclusive membership and they thought that would work people okay. got excited the first month or two yeah. and in the end they had to open it up so study the market yeah. i think it's really important for you as you are coming in and and this is something we have to deal with with our clients even with dagon media you know trying to make them understand that people get excited and and it happened even with pizza hut we beat a world record we thought ha it's going to work we opened stores in some places where we didn't do the right research like kabwe where we've had to close down our store because we didn't research the kawe market. The kawe market actually liked chicken and chips so it was hungry lion for them. They would come into Pizza Hut, the whole of Pizza Hut to buy wings and chips and walk out. 
because that's what that market wanted but wings and chips are not our main product so we realized we had made a mistake as a business we realized even as dagon media that we had assumed that what works in lusaka works everywhere it was a big expensive lesson so i would say i can't really directly tell you it's going to work i would say let's do some research how do you do research in zambia because uh, online uh, is a big challenge well, where yeah. would be the one stop shop where you go and say where do i get that hi on zambia si, si. yeah <laughs> i'm just going to tell you <laughs> i'll just isn't. be honest <laughs> Hey. It's Gunzim Mhlaven. Ah. I think you're going to have to work a bit more than you would uh where you come from South Africa? South Africa, yes. Yeah. You're going to have to work maybe 30% or 50% harder than you would to get the type of um research and and information that you need in South Africa out here. You you have to be ready to do way more work because of the the environment and the market that you're in. I I honestly would advise you to really not think of it as a one-stop shop where I'm going to find everything I need to know about the Zambian women. You really have to if it's get women from different, you know, do a focus group. I'll advise you to do a focus group. Get 10 different women from different backgrounds or 10 women that you feel are your target. sit them down ask them questions to you know to gain some knowledge on what is going on because what works in south africa i will tell you right now will not always work here do your market research thank you so much yeah all right lulu it's been awesome having you your last um advice to the startup companies out there um I would say um keep going. I'm, I I think we are in a an interesting time um with the economy. Things are not as they were before. You know, I have um some people really close to me who started a certain type of business years ago and it was quick money. You know, it was easy and then they start the same business again, you know, trying to expand and they realize it's not as easy as it was. But keep going at it. Find that niche. be that solution i i will keep emphasizing that as an entrepreneur be that solution that is needed for a challenge that you see look for the challenge be the solution and be patient be hard working there's a lot of self entitlement with um especially the millennials as we are called where we feel i want to make money now you know and even with the creative entrepreneurs who are trying to be mcs and so forth No but how come that one gets the endorsement it came after 12 years in the industry honey so you have to be patient and allow yourself to grow because the market here especially those that are coming from out of the country also trying to start startups here and getting frustrated with the market understand it's a different market but with patience things do grow we have success stories to prove that business in Zambia can work And 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 the good thing is that more more and more companies are opening up to you know create um funding opportunities for you know for SMEs for young uh, startups so yeah just keep going keep at it and and just believe and remember no matter what we keep moving awesome thank you so much for coming lulu thanks for hasn't having she me. been amazing <laughs> oh, thank you so much thank you.